So this is actually a very important, a very important lecture because it covers grounds that essentially, I think, the entire world is dealing with, and that is basically the translation of the Quran in the various languages, be it Farsi, if it be Hebrew, if it be in English, among other things, but especially English because that is what we're dealing with at this time. And for those that were born in the States and or Arabic is a second language and English has been the medium for understanding, it has also been a medium for understanding but also actually has at times been a medium for confusion. Not the language, but the source in which they are receiving their information about the Qur'an. So we refer to the translation of the meaning of the Qur'an. That being said, there are several reasons because of that. First and foremost, as you know, when it comes to the translation, it involves the scope of the translator, his knowledge and his understanding of both languages, and bringing it in a fashion in which and or methodology he chooses. So he may think and, and or she may think in her mind that I am translating literally, and that's the best form. But when they do so, they don't, uh, at times, it could be due to the deficiency in their language capabilities that they assume they're doing a literal translation, but actually they are not. And why do you think they might possibly be not doing a literal translation? Though they themselves think they're doing a literal translation. Yeah, that's of understanding Arabic in and of itself. Yeah. yeah. It has many meanings within the word. Very good. Great. So we're Great. to be perceiving from the eye of the different from Very good. Great. So their perception of what is literal could not be similar to someone else's literalism when it comes to understanding that particular text. So this is actually exceptionally important. If a person, for example, was to the word saq. Saq, we have spoken of previously, is a word that entails shin in Arabic, correct? Shin. However, saq could also, in reference, depending on the context, give reference to the difficulty of the circumstance. Yom an saq giving a difficulty to the circumstance. And again, this is an example. It doesn't mean everything is like that, but at times, it's exceptionally important. As a result, what happens in the translation, particularly when the translator chooses a methodology, so there are criteria when a person translates, generally speaking, points that are in the mind of the translator. Number one, their capability in both languages. Number two, the understanding of both languages. Number three, especially the understanding of the Qur'an now. And number four, their strength in understanding of the Qur'an. And number five, and number six, and it goes on. So as a result, this translator is basically providing information for the reader, depending really on him being the intermediary, and or she being the intermediary. So at this fine point, as a result, because of the perception and the importance of what they're translating, scholars throughout history, Islamic history, from early periods, from the Sahaba and afterwards, they were very, they, when they came to translation, they took it quite serious. They took it very serious, actually. And you can assume why. I think many of us can understand why they took it so seriously. And it wasn't as laxed as it is now. Generally speaking, when it comes to speaking about Islam and science and representing Islam, etc., right now it's very laxed. Right now there are so many shiukh, and there are so many people that grow the beard, and there are so many people that have the amama now. And this sheikh is that sheikh, and that sheikh is this sheikh, and everyone is shiukh nowadays. And especially in what comes particularly, again, about the Qur'an. So they will bring a translation and or an ayah, and they have understood it in a certain fashion, and then they translate it so, so, so easily. They take it so easily. It is very easy for them, lightly. And again, previously, like Sa'id Musayb, rahimahullah ta'ala, he was arguably the most knowledgeable of the tabi'een. Rarely do you find him getting into deep tafsir. Rarely do you find that. You usually find his fatawa involving fiqh. He goes into fiqh quite a bit. He's a faqih. 
But when it comes to direct tafsir of the Qur'an and the element of translation because it involves the sphere of tafsir, you find him quite limited in that and or minimal. Because of awe and splendor, not that he doesn't have the knowledge. It's because for him it was something so, so important, so deep, something so precise and something that meant so much to him. But again, nowadays, unfortunately, it's, um, things have changed and it is a very sad thing to see. It really is. It's a very sad thing to see. So with that brief introduction, we will inshallah commence on the topic today which, which involves translation of the Qur'an. And it also involves a concept of different languages when it comes to the Qur'an. And it also involves the concept of the perspective of how to translate and, and or more as to what to translate. This is very important. What to translate versus how to translate. Today is not necessarily how to translate. It's more like what to translate. But what's the difference between how and what? When you hear how and or what? What comes to your mind? In the way that I would think about it is how is your methodology of translation? this way, this path versus that path, or do you think of it this way versus this way, or do you go literal versus, you know, interpretation of meaning uh, mm -hmm. versus what is more of, you know, what verses would require, you know, I guess more work or more effort to be put into to get what was intended out of them or to get the robustness of the meaning in it Very versus good. what verses are, are pretty, I mean, what Very about good. doesn't need a lot of translation. Yeah, good. Very good. So it's very important. How versus what is very, very important. And how with what is very important. Extremely important. So time has passed now. We're living in an era in which the Qur'an has been translated by a number of translators into languages. Completely, completely translated. And at times there isn't helpful hints and understanding the information that the one who's reading the translation in is. There isn't explanations to help them to understand, among other things. Whereas in the past, when it came to the Qur'an, for those that were scholars in Arabic, for them, they still would go ayah by ayah, ten ayahs by ayahs, then move on, like Umar al-Khattab. So Umar al-Khattab, Sa'id al-Musayb, and these things, but nowadays, you find it, again, it's not quantity. It, I mean, nowadays it's become quantity versus quality. So how is how to translate, but what to translate is something that not a lot of people pay attention to. We, if we were able to go back in time, maybe a good idea would be, actually, you shouldn't translate the entire Qur'an, do you see, entirely, and produce it and give it, and make copies of it and produce it as a whole. But instead, Prophet ﷺ, when he wrote a letter and communicated to people and wanted to show his position, what he was talking about, he would place one ayah. So he'd write that ayah and send a letter to a people in which they didn't speak Arabic, they had people who studied Arabic who would translate it, for example, for this king. So one of his, his letters, he said, As-salamu ala man taba al-huda. Bismillah. Ya ha'al kita'alu ila kalibatin sa'an baynana wa baynakum. Alla na'buda illa Allah. And that's what he left for entire people of an entire different language. He didn't write, he translated entire surah to Nisa, you see, or under the entire surah to Imran, which is part of that ayah. But it was one ayah which he sent out to the people to, to understand. We'll go to some of, some of these details. Not too many details, but hopefully it just covers the general goal in the time that we have. So such an important thing, I think some of us have experienced this. If you open ever the translation of the Qur'an, even the Qur'an itself, sometimes if you don't have the tools, we've spoken of that. But you open the translation and a person reads, Ar-Rahman ala al arsh istawa The merciful, he, something of al-arsh and istiwa. So they start to think, is it anthropomorphism? Anthropomorphism meaning that we give qualities to God that are human-like. And or they come across other verses, so they stop and they think about it, and sometimes it pulls back. 
It sometimes it pulls a person back. And this is one of the things that people are dealing with nowadays. Um, as we previously said, just to refresh, previously there were verses of the Qur'an and topics that were spoken among scholars. They'd sit and they'd discuss it, and or in the groups of scholars, and or in the classroom where it involves you know, more advanced knowledges. So it wasn't something that a lot of people talked about. It wasn't very popular. It was something they would discuss among themselves. And the regulatory knowledges that was well known was out there. People knew that the most important things are foundations, the fundamentals. Nowadays, it's that category which involves these things they used to discuss in the classroom. That's the most popular thing now. That's where the books are written on for those that hold a position against Islam, for example. They use these type of things, these type of topics, and they try to now publicize it for the public, though themselves have a deficiency in understanding the topic. And those foundational knowledges, which was the most important thing, that was always what was, what was talked about when you talked in the manabil, when you wrote, when you spoke, when you wrote letters to other people, those things is as if no one really cares about. They don't care about that. And this is a very difficult, this is a very sad thing. It's a very sad thing. And as a result, you have a lot of misunderstandings out there. And you have a lot of strange ambiguities that are out there. And you have a lot of confusion. And for some people, this religion or the idea of religion being something simple and easy, Socrates, for example, Socrat, he said in his opinion, God is simply one. You see the concept of symbolism is simply one. And that's very unique because for Socrat, for Socrates, he comes from a perspective which is his human intellect. He didn't de depend on dogmatic references, revelation, Quran, Torah, and Jesus. He was before Jesus by 400 years approximately. After Dawood by about 500. So he was in this period, and this is what he concluded just using the aql of the mind. We have in the Quran, Allah, 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 and it gives a perspective about language, Arabic, and also a non-Arabic language. Decode. What does that word mean to you, decode? I mean, I don't want to say decipher, but it's taking a set of words, letters, understanding, and then putting them in a, in a form that would be understood. Sometimes people will send messages, there's encryption. So they take the message and they mix it all up. And then you have a specific algorithm to decode that message and put it back into a normal form which would be understood. Very good. Very good. Do you have any idea when you hear the word? In? Decoding is very important. So as you can see, we didn't place translation. What we placed was decoding. Translation is good. Many of people know what translation is. It involves having the language and placing that, the meaning of that statement into another language. But de to decode, it provides something deeper. It provides something deeper. It provides an element in which a person investigates this information in that language, whatever it may be, and then extracting that information and producing it in another format in which they attempt to make it as equal as possible. But they will realize, for example, if you were telling me the word algorithm, that's one word, correct? Algorithm. But to explain algorithm to someone who doesn't know algorithm, what will it take? Pictures and words. Pictures and words, and you go into details. Do you see? Because now a person, he doesn't know what algorithm is. That's the code. Algorithm is the code. As a scholar of algorithm and or mathematics, whatever it may be, and or a person who studied it, you know what it is. So if I'm speaking or you're speaking to someone that knows what it is, you can say the algorithm, this, this, and that. And they can understand. But for someone that doesn't have that tool, you have to be able to decode what algorithm is and provide an explanation in this language and or in this observation Whatever it may be, whatever it may be. In Greek philosophy, when they spoke 
spoke of the concept of God and where is God and does God take up space? Is he inside of time? Is he outside of time? Where is he? Is he up? Is he down? Is he left mm -hmm. and or is he right? These type of things. The point they were trying to give a reference to was that in the concept of logic, intellect, and in the debate if God exists or not, a proposition is proposed. And that proposition is, where is God? Okay, where is God? So the ideology in using logic and or Greek logic, you cannot say where is God because in their perspective, generally speaking, if you come from the Abrahamic perspective, God is one, he's different. But you cannot, you cannot see God in that essential element, component. So they say, how do we know something exists if there isn't a form, something of that nature? And then they, give, they provide a counter-argument in which they say, do you, does thought take up space? Thought, the idea of thinking, thought, the thought itself, does that take up space? You see in cartoons, right, in Garfield, they a big cloud and they put information, right? So right now, I'm, a person is sitting and he has so many thoughts. We're not talking about neurons, electrolytes. We're not talking about the brain. That's where it's happening. But we're talking about the concept of thought itself. It's so deep. And for a person to be able to sit and think and produce a thought, and this thought has so much information inside of it, the question still remains, does it take up space or not? Does it take up space or not? So right now, what we are doing, we're just providing an example. The concept of consciousness, God consciousness. That word, God consciousness. You find me translated from taqwa, God consciousness, consciousness. To speak to somebody and explain what consciousness is, you, you have to be able to provide information, decode what that entails and provide the meaning for that person to be able to comprehend. That's why we talked about in Greek logic when it says, do this thought take up space? The concept of God being different. You see, the concept of God being uh, outside of time, the designer of time, the element of space, meaning that space doesn't, that, he, that space was there in the existence of God. So, God. so space always existed. This type of concept, I mean, it goes into depth in these type of things, but essentially, who al awwal wal akhir wal bahir wal batin, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's different, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a person comes across a verse in which it implies something. Right? نَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ The jugular vein. We are closer to the jugular vein. So what, what does that mean? What does that entail? The word algorithm. What does that entail? Being able to decode it and provide information. That's why I think it's important for a person to think of something. You're not translating the Qur'an. It might be good to say translating the meaning of the Qur'an based upon my scope of understanding by Sahih International, which are five, six individuals, by uh, so-and-so scholar, Piktal, by so-and-so scholar. That's good to say, but I think there should be additional comprehension involved. Interpretation, decoding, and the various synonyms that involve this concept, that involve this concept. It's very important. I don't think people, some people out there truly understand the importance of it. It really is very important for a person to comprehend this element. So what happens is the idea of translation, again, in historically among scholars, was something that was very deep. It was something very important. And it was also something that was very dear to them. It was very dear to them. When they spoke of an ayah, for example, it was something very serious for them. When they spoke to someone... Andrew attempted to explain the ayah to them. It was something extremely serious for them. Because it was something so dear, so important. And they didn't want to follow a particular methodology. It doesn't give it due justice, due right. So this was their mindset. And again, nowadays, it's very simple. Translation is very simple. Tafsir nowadays is very simple. And to wear a shamad is very simple. And to grow a beard and these type of things, symbolizing that we have so many scholars out there it's very simple. Whereas if with true investigation, true, true insight and sincerity, you find that it's actually not as that. It's not as simple. So these are some of the meanings of decoding. Some of the meanings of decoding.
from the dictionary, Oxford Dictionary, among others, to extract, extract meaning from, to extract meaning from, to translate data or a message from a code into the original language or form, to analyze and interpret a communication or image, right? to analyze and interpret a communication or image. Decoding, it really hits home. On the topic, it really hits home. Extract meaning from. Extract the meaning from. To translate from a code into the original language or form. And form here could entail a number of things. You are translating this information into a form which doesn't necessarily constitute the same symbols, the same construction. What does that mean? That language, you see, when you translate it, now you're using different symbols, different construction, different sounds, among other things as well. So it is a concept of decoding. Concept of decoding. To analyze the information, to interpret the information, a communication or image. To decode. Decoding. So what happens? Again, you have these, these. Unfortunately, I don't want to say troglodytes, but people that are unaware. From a number of camps. From a number of camps. One camp here, the extreme left, and another camp, the extreme right. And if we are able just to stop and look at each side, they actually resemble each other quite a bit. They resemble each other quite a bit in the methodology they choose for the minhaj. Extreme right and the extreme left. So these are people that have two extremes about a topic. But the way they approach things, the, the method and the tools they use is similar. And they don't realize how actually similar they are because they fall into a world in which they blind themselves in. But they're quite similar in the way they think and the way they approach things and the way they handle things as well. So in that light, when it comes to translation, for example, translation of the meaning in the Quran, among other things, these two camps, their methodology in doing so, quite similar. The polemics that are out there about Quran, for example, look how they provide the information look to the translation they are providing, and look to the interpretation they are providing. And then on the opposite spectrum, that other extreme, look how they handle the information, look how they provide the information, in what scope they provide the information, and the methodology they provide the information. They resemble each other. It's quite a resemblance between the two, and it's very sad, it's unfortunate. So what do you think are some of the benefits of translation? What do you think are some of the, you can say, not as beneficial of translation? Let's start out with the benefits. What do you think? Any ideas, translation? <laughs> um, so, I mean, there is a certain amount of information that can be spread, even okay. with the translation that is lackluster, right? Yeah. There's a certain amount of information that does get disseminated and spread to the people, uh, regardless of how good or bad the translation is. There you that go. would be a benefit to that. Information is spread. So you're saying one of the pros of translation, particularly on the topic that we're talking about, the Quran, is that information is spread. Right. You would say that's one of the pros. It, I mean, you can take it as a pro and a con. Uh, yeah. But the fact that information that might have not been available to them is now available to them, especially if they're using it for good purposes. Okay. It's definitely, pro. I mean, it could be a con too. Right? Yeah, yeah. So bro, bro, Dr. Omar is saying that it's either, it could be a pro and or con, the concept of translation, but in the context of benefit of it, you have given an explanation that it provides information of something that may have not been known previously. Is that, does that sound like something you, you're mentioning? Yeah. How about uh, the sister? What do you think? Any benefit of translation? What can you think of? A pro. So I have something to say. Okay. I would like when I like watch the video again on Facebook, I, I 
Okay. So often it hate how I sound on <laughs> okay. That's why I made it a point not to speak as much as I can. Okay. <laughs> so that's why I keep it I keep I left on the left Okay. 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 <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good, inshallah. Oh well. So any cons? What are some cons? Uh, the same thing, right? Certain information might not necessarily be good to disseminate. If it's disseminated or false views or views that are, I mean, we talked about earlier, right? If people who translate Fatiha and they are translating Baitul Mahdu Ghanim or Ghanim and they decide to insert in their specific groups, yeah. that can lead to a great amount of misunderstanding. Okay. And while that's a valid interpretation, it's not a very smart interpretation. No. Just no. kind of throw out there. No. Um, so he is, so you're in your proposition that some of the cons of translation is the same thing. The extra information and uh, the productivity of a person who translates and places information inside of it could cause more harm than good. Is that what you are, are mentioning? Yeah. Some of them. Let's go back to the benefits, translation. So you said extra information, correct? Anything else? Is there any other type of benefit there I can mean, be from the translation of the Quran? Yeah, I mean, for me personally, understanding what words mean with the more literal translation that helps Great. understand what a word means or when a what word, words mean. Great. Yeah, or what a word is used in the Arabic and in the English, it shows a little bit more clarity great. for me personally. Great, great. So for a person, for example, that doesn't have strength in the Arabic language, and is stronger in the English language, they're able to, to comprehend something with a little bit more splendor. Yes. Translating in that language for that person, having to be able to read, read that, for example. So some people, you find that they, for them, they started to learn Arabic by comparing Quran in Arabic with English translation. For some people, this is how they started to learn, learn Arabic language. They started to learn the Arabic language. But what's interesting is that also on the Khan section as well, what you proposed can be what? A very big Khan. And how, how can it be a Khan as well? I mean, you could understand a, a word completely incorrectly because that person, instead of having a more literal translation, had a more transliteration, more of a, more of a meaning. And so you think that this word means this, but it might actually mean the opposite. Or in that specific situation, it might mean that. And you look to another eye and you're like, oh, same word. Exactly, very good. The same exact meaning. And very you good. find out that this word has one meaning over here, or contextually it has the opposite meaning, or that was a form of, I don't want to say sarcasm, but you no. know, a striking example. Very good. So, Quran uses jazat, right? Yeah. It, it technically means reward, but in certain eyes, it, it doesn't really mean reward. Sure. It means punishment. Very good. Very good. Very, very good. So you can tell, a person can tell by your, by your philosophy that a Khan in this topic would tell that a person is left to the vulnerability of the person who's translating. And at the same time, in that vulnerability, a person can be deceived because a person who translated a word placed a word, but that same word in another context could have a different meaning. Is that what you proposed? That's a good observation. And it's an important observation. It's an important observation. It is a very important observation. What else are there? What type of benefits are there? What else is there? A translation, yeah. So we've said extra information. And we've said what else? Helping a person in understanding, understanding con contemplation. Very good. What else is there? Some type of benefits to translation and the meaning. To be able to read, just to read the information, right? To read the information, correct? That would be another form of benefit. And, uh, and or a con. Yeah. <laughs> so how would it be a con? If the information that's tra if the, if the translation is incorrect uh -huh. or you know, has shortcomings, then you process information. Then you, you do get to read Quran, but you're not reading it as, you're not reading it in a way that the meaning was intended to be. Good. I guess it's what okay. So as you can see, for every benefit we have proposed and or pro, there is, seems to be a con on the concept. So when it comes to fiqh, one of the qawaid we've talked about is the concept of 
Al-i'tidal, a balance, a type of balance, right? And the mawazin or mizan, a scale. So at times what happens is one of the rules fuqaha they use when giving a response to something and or trying to attempt to evaluate a circumstance and provide the best response they can is this tool. What good outweighs and what if harm outweighs the good? So in this circumstance, let me ask you a question. Something outweighing the other. Would you say as a whole, now that we've just talked about it briefly, as a whole what you have thought of, is it more beneficial to translate the entire Qur'an? Or it is not as beneficial? Which one? Because right now we've talked about pros and cons. Slightly, in your opinion, which one do you think outweighs the other? Would you say they're the same? The pros are the same and the cons are the way the weight is the same. <laughs> I mean, I'm on the side of benefit that's okay. more beneficial mm -hmm. but I mean, we, we can see the the issues with it nowadays, right, where the whole Quran is translated and people are like, and we will pick this verse and so it becomes a huge issue, but I think generally the amount of information that can be disseminated to Muslims who might never have the opportunity to speak Arabic, mm -hmm. just having that you know, ability to be able to, even if it's the interpretation of the meaning through an individual's lens of the word of God, it's mm -hmm. still better than not having any words. Mm -hmm. I'm not a scholar, so it's just... Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's speculation. Right now we're in a discussion. Yeah. We're not giving verdicts and we're not signing our names up. Yeah? Let me ask you a question. Let's put translation aside. Early pioneers with connection to Qur'an, for example, how did they approach learning it? Umar al-Khattab and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and, and these type of individuals. I mean, validated sources, right? from I mean, the prophets or people that the prophets are. Okay, very good. And was it as, did they approach it as a whole? Oh, pieces. It was in pieces. Correct, they approached it in a certain amount of information. And then that information, eventually they would progress from that information. So these are pioneers. And what a lot of people are missing out nowadays is the idea of learning from the seerah itself. Because it's very relative. It's very relative. And the idea that you could be living in an era in which people's capabilities of understanding are not very high. So you look to that circumstance in the seerah and you find that capabilities of individuals at a certain time frame weren't very high as well. So how did Ali Sallallahu handle the circumstance? So in that concept, this is in Arabic. It was a few ayahs, and there was elaboration, there was explanation, there was correlation, among other things. At the time of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there were a number of companions who memorized the Qur'an. They had it memorized entirely. Okay, and when he passed away, they had the entire thing memorized. From them is Ali, this is what Shams al Dahabi says, Ali radiallahu ta'ala is one of them. Uh, another, for example, is Uthman ibn Affan, rahimahullah ta'ala. Others as well, Zayd ibn Thabit, and others as well. So the Shabzani Dhabi, he approximated is about seven that became well known at the time of Rosh Hashanah in connection to those that have memorized. I'm talking about becoming well known, flourished. We're not talking about after the passing of how many companions memorized it, but at that time that became really well known. Others argued that there were much more. But they, when it comes to the references in which you are saying that it entails a number four or seven or these things, this is in reference to those that were well known. They were popular about it. So when you look to the Asani, the recitation of the Quran in our days, Hafs and Asim and these type of things, you find that it goes up to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud or it goes up to Ali radiallahu ta'ala, these individuals. So it became flour it flourished, became well known in this concept. So the point we're trying to entail, their approach wasn't quantity, it was, it was quality. So that's in the Arabic concept. That is in the Arabic concept. You know there were times when Umar al-Khattab, not much, but it was times in which he, he would ask people. He'd ask a person, he said, what, is this, what does this thing, portion mean? This word mean? This is known, but what does this portion mean? And he would ask people and he would hear what they had say. And he would learn from that. He would learn from that approximation. This is in Arabic. And we spoke to Prophet ﷺ, he did deal with Ajam, people not Arabs at his time. And he wrote letters. And when he, when he wrote a letter, what did he write? He would write one ayah in Arabic, for example, something short, straight to the point, clear cut, because he knows there's going to be a translation. 
those individuals don't necessarily speak Arabic. There will be a person from them who studied Arabic and he translates for this individual to understand, to be able to comprehend. And as a result, in that translation, he knew there would be this context, and we know that at times translation causes a lax in the beauty of something. So if a person was to translate a poetry in Spanish to English, it's, it might sound slightly strange, let alone the idea of something very, very uh, literalistic, and at the same time very literary, beautiful, poetic, among others in the Qur'an. Something very important for people to consider. So this question was a question in which they thought, especially later, if the Qur'an should be translated as a whole and or not. And even if it should be translated as sections and or not. So this is something they discussed among themselves. And hopefully uh, we're going to address some topics that are involved on this. So this idea, benefit versus issue with translation. In my humble perspective, I don't think... For example, if a person comes and he says, I want to learn about the Qur'an, that a person who's asked this question gives him a translation of the Qur'an as a whole. I don't think that's a good idea. If that's the method you'd like to do. When you think of these books that teach about Islam, essentially what they're doing, they're giving explanations of what the Qur'an teaches. So that could be more valuable to the person that wants to learn. Because, again, what they're doing, all of these, these works that are out there in fiqh, all of these works that are out there, the idea behind it is going back to what is taught in the Qur'an. So they provide explanation, information, they are able to comprehend and apprehend, and from there they are able to build. But if a person nudges and he forces upon himself, no, I want to read the Qur'an, and I want a book that gives information about it, and or translation of the meaning, and or explanation, think of passages. You see, think of passages. The idea of giving an entire Qur'an to one person, not because of the question, is it Yajuz al Mutahar and Yamas al Quran or Ghayrak? Is it okay that, that person that is of a different faith, for example, touches this and or that, or this type of information? Not because of that question. Because I said him, you know, he sent a letter, there was Quran in it, and they were going to people that were of different methodology and they would touch it, for example. And we're not going to talk at this point, the debate, if a person could touch the Quran while they are with wudu or without wudu. It's a mas'ala khilafiya, bayl fuqaha. Not necessarily talking about this element here. Just talking about the idea in which you as a person is being a facilitator. I think the person should consider, especially nowadays, not necessarily giving an entire mushaf to someone, translation of the meaning to someone. But instead, you can say a chapter, a portion of a chapter, and there are certain publications that give sections of the Qur'an. So you can give a portion here, a portion there. Chapter of Mary, for example, this chapter of the Mirur. And or even, preferably again, just a book about the concept of a verse. So a book about the concept of a verse. Where, for example, Allah says, uh, a verse in the Quran where, where it teaches, it says, it says, uh, uh, That verse by itself, involving the concept of purpose of life, and is everything just a mere junction by mischance, by chance that is, and the concept of a greater being, and the concept of meeting, it's greater God. That verse by itself should be lectures. That verse by itself should be books written on these type of things. So it's a very thing. It's a very important thing. I think people should consider within their lives. We've passed that ring. I know we've passed it. That it's already been translated and it's published as a whole. All of these places. We've passed that thing. But still, it doesn't mean that you cannot try to control something, right? Try to control something. If this is the circumstance people are doing it, it doesn't mean you have to do it. I remember I was trying to find parking right now. And I'm looking around. I drove here. I went to the end of the street and I went back. I come across a place and there was an opening, alhamdulillah. So I had to make a choice. I, wanted, I could make it very easy for me and I can go to this opening. But by doing so, I would have to contradict the sign where it says stop, do not enter. So the sign was right here and the parking was right, the free parking, open parking was right next to it. So I had to make a choice. I can go like this and just park, or I have to go around, and once I go around, I can park. But you know, we, we grew up in a different way. We're taught things. So I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go around and come around. So I did do that. And I went around, I was excited, I was coming around, and what a person did, he went ahead and he parked. And how did they park? They entered in the section where you're not supposed to enter. It says, do not enter it. They went ahead and entered and they parked. So at that point, what happened was I could have done that, right? I could have disregarded this issue 
or this advice and just parked and been happy about it. But no, I said, I chose, we have a different way we've been taught, and we have a different perspective on things to be organized among other things, so I follow the rules. By, by following the rules, what happened is someone else did the damage, that is correct, and or if there was any damage, but they contradicted what was taught. But it doesn't mean I have to do that, even if I feel and or see someone else doing it. So the point is that things that are done out there, even if they're popular, doesn't mean you have to do it. And things that are done there, even though it could seem in the short run, short run slightly beneficial, doesn't mean in the long run it will be beneficial. Benefits versus the issues with translation is a very important topic. People should really think about it, especially people that have a voice, wherever they may be. Based upon the translation of the Qur'an right now, we're going to move to a fiqh question. Okay, fiqh question that has been talked about. Because nowadays, as you know, it is actually a question that arises quite a bit. Is it okay, for example, in salah, for a person that doesn't know the Arabic, for example, to recite, to say the information in the language that they speak? If it may be, for example, be it of Persian, if it be Hebrew, if it be English, if it be, again, something that is not Arabic. Is it permissible for a person to recite Qur'an like that? Or read Qur'an like that? And or in sujood, to make supplication to God in a different language? Does it have to be in Arabic? Or for example, in fiqh, when it involves the question of marriage and al-aqt and these type of things, does it have to be in Arabic and or not? Could it be in a different language? So this is a something that actually has been discussed. And for certain individuals, at times, they haven't studied fiqh. They haven't studied fiqh. And as a result, what happens at times, they, they're very monolithic in their perspective about things. And as a result, again, they could cause more harm for a circumstance than good, depending on the circumstance. So Malik ibn Anas, rahimahullah ta'ala, for him, one of his views was a person shouldn't respond to these masail of fiqh unless they studied the opinions on it. Unless they studied the opinions on it. So we go back to the circumstances that are out there in this movement nowadays, in which, again, people are responding very easily. There isn't reflection, there isn't pondering, there isn't codes, there isn't fiqh, usul of fiqh involved. Everyone is just it's freelancers everywhere. Everyone's freelancing, unfortunately. So what does this say? What does this statement say? Brother Omar and or anyone. Yeah. So who, who's saying this? Who's this statement? So what is the translation of the meaning in your perspective? What's the translation of the meaning of this statement? Let me read it once, okay. inshallah. So, right here is Qadi Abu Bakr ibn Ali, rahimahullah ta'ala. He is saying, Ta'allaqa Abu Hanifa. Okay, Ta'allaqa Abu Hanifa. Wa ashabuhu fi jawazit al qira'ati. Fi salati bil ajaniyati li kulihi ta'ala inna hadha lafi suhuf al ula suhuf Ibrahim wa Musa. So, before we go on to explain what it's talking about here, who's Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala? A big imam. Right? When was he born? So in the 80. 80th year in the Hijri calendar. So Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, he saw Anas ibn Malik. So what does that mean? So yeah, he saw a companion. That's the age he lived in. It doesn't mean it's established that he, he narrated from him, that he was able to acclimate and comprehend a hadith of Sallam and teach it from others. It's not. But he saw him with his own eyes. So Imam al-Shafi'i, when he talked about Abu Hanifa, he said, النَّاسُ عِيَادٌ عَلَىٰ أَبِي حَنِيفَةٍ فِي الْفِقْ That basically when it comes to fiqh, people out there are just ordinaries. So essentially Abu Hanifa is a great scholar of fiqh, of jurisprudence, among other things as well. So Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, has a very um, interesting background. He has a very interesting background. But I just wanted to throw this out there so we have a better grasp of what we are talking about here. It's a... He's a famous scholar and he has a school of thought among other things as well. So it says, Ta'allaqa Abu Hanifa ta'u ashabu. What does Ta'allaqa here mean? 
Yeah, ta'allaqa is known to mean to, be, to hang something, right? Yeah. But what does it in, in this context mean? He was attached and or he held the position. You see, so, so the difference. Now we're talking about translation of meaning again. So ta'allaq would mean many things. And one of its inferences is means to hold a position. And we know allaq al shay that he was able to you know, hang something. Or ta'allaq. Ta'allaq also means what? To connect, but it also means to explain. It could also mean to explain, among other things. So this is very important. So we say, تَعَلَّقَ أَبُوْ حَنِيفَةَ وَأَصْحَابُهُ أَصْحَابُهُ School of thought. Right? Generally it means companions, but in reference here it could mean, it means school of thought. وَأَصْحَابُهُ فِي جَوَازِ الْقِرَاءَةَ فِي الصَّلَاةِ الْقِرَاءَةِ فِي الصَّلَاةِ So what does jawaz mean? What does jawaz mean? The, the permissibility. Permissibility. Al qiraati. Al qira as well. The recitation of the Quran, correct? Fis salati. In prayer. Correct? Bil ajamiyati. Non Arabic. Yeah, al ajamiyati means foreign. Something non Arabic. Non Arabic. Biqawlihi ta'ala. And what does biqawlihi ta'ala mean? Yeah, very based off of biqawlihi. So biqawlihi, it means, right, uh, by the statement. But in reference to the meaning, it means the reference and, and, and proof that he is holding by is this statement. Qawlihi ta'ala, inna hadha la fi ula suhuf Ibrahim wa Musa. Of course, he has, other, he has other argumentations. The school of thought has other argumentations. So this statement gives an inference. What is that inference? What does the statement mean? Yeah, yeah, so this is the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa and Ashabu, and the school of thought of his. What is it teaching here? Oh, you can recite Quran in a non or you can recite Quran and Salah in a non Arabic language. Yeah. So that's good. So, what we find here in this opinion, it's okay for a person to recite the Quran, be it in Salah and or outside the Salah, in a different language. Okay? Yeah in Salah and or outside the Salah, to recite it in a different language, to recite it in a different language, okay? But on the topic of Salah, this is very interesting. One day a person was telling me a story in which they prayed at a mosque, and they said, Allah Akbar, they prayed, followed a person that was an Imam, and it turns out the Imam was not a, a uh, person that was very strong in the Arabic language. So what he did is he said Takbiratul Ihram, they followed, then he started to recite the Fatiha. But he recited it in English while in prayer. A fard prayer, a compulsory prayer, that is as well known. Fard means wujub, not necessarily compulsory, but the sense is obligation, a level, level of status. So they started to laugh. Are you serious? They started to giggle. They started to laugh. So the person who did that, that was a person who chose Islam, as is commonly known as a convert or revert, and there's debates about that. It doesn't know Arabic. So he, out of love for goodness, this is what he knew, so he recited in the English language. It's very important to know, God says in the Quran, God is, he's the judge, for everybody. It's not me or you or anyone else. He knows the hearts of the people. So people started to laugh. Like, no way, are you serious? And uh, just the way people have nowadays is because they're not spending time studying fiqh and these type of things. And as we said, certain things are now becoming public. Whereas in the past, it was, just, it, was very, it was very marginalized. Everything now all over the internet. And now gossip all over the internet. And bad manners all over the internet, for example. And this person says that, and this cracks on that person and says this. It's very, it's chaos. There's a lot of chaos. A lot of chaos out there. So you can imagine the type of drama that happened. This person, he doesn't know that. Oh my God, oh my God. One time I came across a person's statement in which he was talking about a topic and then he said, you know, this is not halal, but someone's going to come and he's going to say Imam Malik's point of view is this and that. And he was saying out of degradation to make fun of, to belittle. You see, 
It's not the fault of the people that you haven't studied. It's not the fault of the people that you ha don't have a very advanced level of studying. It's not their fault. That's why Umar al Prophet he knew when he dealt with people, there were things that were okay, but he knew that certain individuals and their mentalities are not prepared to understand this information. So as a result, we said this before, religiousness, spirituality should make a person more friendly, not more aggressive. You see, be more intellectual, more wise, not more ignorant and or holding a position of aggression. So what we have here is Ta'alaq Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala, this is the Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi. And Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi, he holds the position you cannot. In prayer, recite in a different language. But still, since he's a scholar of analyzing information, he provided the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa that's attributed to him and his school of thought on the approach. And he gave a reference to that. And he says that this is the position. For them it's okay. So for, for in this opinion, if this is the Qur'an, then what about supplication? So a person is in sujood, for example, and they want to pray. They want to supplicate to God. So that's a question that comes up. Is it okay to say it in a different language? So the person, does it have to be in Arabic? And this is why this is bringing a smile on my face. I once came across an Arabic uh, uh, soap opera, per se, and there was a circumstance in which a man was in a dire circumstance, he's in a difficult circumstance, and the way they speak is they speak slang Arabic. Okay? And in that circumstance, he asked someone, he said, make dua for me, make dua for me. So the person makes dua in slang Arabic. Then he says, stop, what are you doing? Say it in fusha. He said, say it in fusha. <laughs> because he felt that, what will that do? It, it, yeah, it increased the probability of acceptance. <laughs> you see? So say it in fusha, what are you doing in, the, in this type of Arabic? You know, say it in fusha. So now, you see, there's a person that goes into salah, and he goes into sujood, and Prophet ﷺ, he said about sujood, It is more probable. It's a place for supplication, for consideration, for sujab dua acceptance, among other things. So a person in this place doesn't know Arabic, and, and or he knows just a little bit of Arabic. Is it okay for him to say the supplication in a different language? So Imam Abu Hanifa's perspective on this opinion, in this, in this attributed opinion of his, for the Qur'an to recite in a different language is okay. So something much lighter than that, of course, is even more probable. And there is fiqh involved, there's other questions. But the point we're trying to talk about here is the relevance of translation, okay? And the relevance of language by itself. And the relevance to it connected to the heart. This example here, is kind of a step outside of what we were talking about translation of the Qur'an in a different language. This concept here is for us to think about something, about manners, you see, characteristics, and the concept of wanting betterment in people's lives. Okay, wanting benefit in people's lives. And this is something very important, having good manners, understanding these things. So Imam Al-Hanifah's perspective in this opinion that's attributed to him, there is some debate about if he if he returned back from this qawl or not, there's another attribution about that. But this is what's famous. This is what has become common. Well, how is that a reference? In هَذَا لَفِي الصُّحُفِ الْأُولَى صُحُفِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُوسَى Why is that a reference for justifying the position of Imam Hanifa on this opinion? I mean, the way that I would look at it, I guess, is that the same statements have been made in other languages yeah. Attributed to divinity by like this. Very good. So it's yes. Not, Very good. It's not the statement in and of itself, but rather the meaning of the statement that becomes divine, I guess. But I, I think that's taking it too far. It's just what it means. Very that good. statement has been made in other languages. Very good. Very good. Very good. So the reference here, Qadi Abu Bakr ibn Arabi is providing one of the references they use that hold that view. In the Hadha lafi suhuf al ula, suhuf Ibrahim wa Musa. That the information that is provided in the hadha, there are some opinions of what it entails, but the most probable one is that in reference to the surah, Sabih Rabbika Ala, the information that is inside of it, at the end of the surah it says, Inna hadha la fi suhuf al ula, Suhuf Ibrahim Musa, in reference to that information that's in the surah. So in that concept, these suhuf that were before, Musa's suhuf, in what language was it in? Probably it was in Hebrew. Most probably in Hebrew. In Arabic, what is Hebrew? Ibrania. Very good. So he is saying, if this is that, in that previous book, then this is a reference of legitimacy to say recitation of the Qur'an in a different language. 
So earlier we talked about point of views of how scholars, when it comes to translation of the Qur'an, they were quite hesitant. They were hesitant. So Imam Abu Hanifa's view when it translation of the Qur'an to the language of Farsi, he comes from that background, Persian language. He held the view, it's okay. It's okay to do so. But it wasn't a view that it was okay to do the whole thing. The reference of his was the view that it's okay to translate for people to understand in that language. But he gave criteria as well. He gave criteria as well. Something to think about. They have all the references of well. They have actually Salman al-Farisi, rahimahullah ta'ala, who was Persian descent. So he was a non-Arab. They asked for translation of the Qur'an. So he did translate some verses in their language for them to be able to comprehend. This is what's been attributed to him. But you can imagine how he translated. He knew who he was speaking to. And he was a scholar of the information he had. So it wasn't something very hasteful. It wasn't a literary translation. Literary, I put parenthesis, because that statement in and of itself has deficiency. has weakness in it. But it was in a methodology they were able to comprehend. They have other references as well. So I just want us to think of something. I'll take a step back here. Yeah, so Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi, he, he comes from a, a Maliki methodology when it comes to jurisprudence. Jurisprudence. So as you can see, he, in his opinion, it's not okay. But he still provided, because that's the way they, they used to think. You see, that's the way they used to think. That's the way they used to approach things. Imam Abu Hanifa, he learned narration from Imam Malik. You know, they crossed in the time frames. They crossed in the time frame. So this is something very important for us to stop and think about. So he learned information, though he was older than Imam Malik by a little. So now we move on to a different book. Okay, the previous reference was by Abu Akhra al-Arabi, famous Spaniard scholar, Maliki perspective. And now we move to Imam, Imam al-Nawawi, who comes from the Shafi'i methodology. So he has a work in which is called Mujmu' Sharh al-Madhab. And what he talks about in the midst of his writings is the opinion of this, of Imam Abu Hanifa, among others. So what does it say? Very good, great. So Imam al Nawawi is writing, and he writes in the midst of his writing, we said, Right, 80th in the Hijri calendar, great Imam. Tajuzu wa tasihu bis salati, bihis salah, mutlaqa. Not bis salat, it says bihis salah. What's the difference between bis salah and bihis salah? Bihis salah, with this, follow this. Yeah, good. Bihis salah, in his salah, connected to his prayers. Right, his connected to his prayers. Find her prayers. Tajuzu wa tasihu bihis salatu mutlaqa. Yeah. For him, in his opinion, Imam know Imam now he's writing about that in the opinion of Abu Hanifa, if a person comes and he recites the Quran in prayer in a different language, it's always okay. There isn't any. There is some criteria, but generally speaking, he gives it. It's always it's always okay. And the topic that we're talking about again, we were talking about earlier about translation of the Quran as a whole. One of the scholars, in the, because in the earlier view they had different views of how to approach it. Imam Abu Hanifa held the view it was okay. It's okay to do so. Not as necessarily as a whole, but references, as we talked about. He uses a reference in the Hadal of Suhb al Ula, and he used example of Salman al Farsi, rahimahullah ta'ala, for example. So Imam al Nawi is writing, Wakala Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, Tajuzu wa tasihu bihi salatu mutlaqa. So there isn't, a cri- there isn't a depth criteria. Now you all you understand why he's saying that. Wakala Abu Yusuf wa Muhammad. Who's Abu Yusuf? So Qadi Abu Yusuf, rahimahullah ta'ala, he was, he was born the year 113 Hijri. Yeah, he was born the year 113 Hijri. Abi Hanif is the born 80. Qadi Abu, uh, Abu Yusuf, rahimahullah ta'ala, became a great Qadi in the Abbasi Empire. And he was one of the elite students of Abi Hanifa. But he still differed with him on opinions. So he's part of his school of thought. 
He loves him more than anything. But there were opinions he said that he held a different view on. Just to show you how they used to think in the secondary category. But they still loved each other and these type of things. It's very important to think about. So he was, uh, like I said, he was born 113. He became a Qadi. And Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal is one of his students. Just to show you how they're connected. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah ta'ala, is one of the students of Qadi Abi Yusuf. Just to show you how they're connected, the world. Imam Abu Hanifa, Malik, close friends. What you find here, Qadi Abi Yusuf and Ahmed ibn Hanbal, close friends. Imam Ahmed is the teacher and friend of Imam al-Bukhari. Just to show you. Something to think about. One of the teachers of Imam al-Bukhari's name was Muhammad ibn Yusuf. Yeah, there you go. So it's a small world. Small world after all. But anyways, you know that one of his teachers of Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, he, he was with his instructor, and as he was leaving the Sham area, which is Halab, Imam Ahmed wanted to go, was going there to see his instructor. But he passed away on the way. And that's how they crossed roads. Not as, essentially. Or initially, but that was an event in which they crossed roads. And Imam Bukhari told him that he passed away. Or essentially, it was attributed, this information. Just to show you how close they were. The way they used to think. So, Qadi Abi Yusuf, Ta'ala, was a great faqih. Among other things, one of his students was Imam Ahmad. Ibn Hanbal. Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Wa Muhammad, Muhammad here, it says, Wa qala Abu Yusuf, who was one of the elite students of Imam Abu Harifa. Wa Muhammad, al-Shaybani. Muhammad al-Shaybani was one of the friends and colleagues of Abu Yusuf, but he was also a student of Imam Abi Hanifa. But Muhammad al-Shaybani is one of the friends and colleagues and considered an instructor of Imam al-Shafi'i. So as you can see how they... Even though they were friends, even though he was an instructor, if you look to Imam al-Shafi'i's work, you find he writes a conversation between him and Muhammad al-Shaybani. Conversation about things they debated and they discussed, and some things why Shafi'i holds a different view. Holds a different view on that topic. So, as you can see, is there is an intermingling prospect here. There is a concept of sharing information, and there's a concept of understanding the realities that in life it's not always going to be black and white, as we discussed. Foundational, yes. But after that, why is that important is because when people were able to place this in the minds of the people, people will calm down. They will calm down. They won't be as aggressive. There will be harmony in the air, among other things as well. Just something to think about. So, وَقَالَ أَبُوْ حَنِيفَ تَجُوزُ وَتَصِحُّ بِهِ الصَّلَاةُ مُطْلَقًا وَقَالَ أَبُوْ يُوسُفْ وَمُحَمَّدْ يَجُوزُ لِلْعَاجِزِ دُونَ الْقَادِرِ So, Abu Hanifa had a more broader perspective, whereas Abu Qadir Abu Yusuf and Muhammad Shaybani they had criteria. The criteria was a person who didn't have the capability of the Arabic language at that time. But they showed the permissibility. They showed the permissibility. So in the context of what we've been talking about, we're tra- talking about translation of the Quran to tra- a different language. And we talked about shortly the concept of the pros and the cons of that. And actually, traditionally, the translation as a whole wasn't very... It wasn't very well supported, one might say. Opinions were out there where it's okay, but they gave rulings and speculations and advice in connection to that. Because of the ideology and possibility of the misrepresentation. And you can see that actually the results of that in our everyday life nowadays. You can see the results of it in a number of circumstances that have come up. They have come up. But now we have to understand that that the damage is there one might say. Or the circumstances is there. But it doesn't mean that we cannot build, build a type of foundation and a safeguard to the circumstances and be aware, to be aware of it. Being aware of it. Okay, this is a little bit longer statement. Someone want to try? <laughs> Yeah. 
Let's go step, uh, statement by statement. That's very good. Thank you. And this is a little bit longer statement. So who is writing this? Is, is Zarkashi is writing this? Yeah? Yeah. He's writing this information. So this is, a, this is about 700 years ago. 800 years ago. He's writing this information. And what's he writing about? He's writing about the concept of translation of the Quran. The concept of it. So he says, فَأَمَّا تَرْجَمَتْهُ لِلْعَمَلِ بِهِ What does that say? Translating it for, in order to do something with it. The action, right? Yeah. To refer back to action, apply. فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ جَائِزٌ لِلْضُرُورَةِ So that's allowed because of its meaning. Ah. Jaiz, yeah, it's, it, there is a leeway, yeah. but he says لِلْضَرُورَةِ <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, exactly, because there's an extreme need. However, let's go on and see what else he says. There's a comma here, right? Better to make it as little as possible so, so as to derive a specific ruling from it. Okay, what, what, else, what did you see in that meaning? Yeah. Yeah, more deserving, suitable, yeah. etc. As you can see, yeah, you know, this is this is this is Arabic, fiqh, and it's not necessarily Quranic Arabic. So what happens when I say Quranic Arabic in that style? So what happens when we attempt to translate this? As you can see, what type of things are happening? So you can imagine something that is of poetic words, powerful words, among other things. Mudabidabina, bina dalik. Among other things, it's, it's very important to be aware of. So what do you say here? فَأَمَّا تَرْجُمَتُ لِلْعَمَلِ بِي فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ جَائِزٌ لِلْضَرُورَةِ He gives that a speculation. Then he goes on to say, وَيَنْبَغِي أَنْ يُخْتَصَرَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ عَلَى بَيَانِ الْمُحْكَمِ مِنْهُ What is deserving in regard to this matter is to confine it to the verses that are muhkam. What does muhkam mean? Rulings. So hukam involves ruling. This one is muhkam. And it may entail rulings. It may I mean, entail. All those things established, like, like. That's a good observation. You're alluding to something. That's good. So what you're doing is correct, but just the thing is, is contextualizing the meaning of what he's saying. These words. So it goes back to the amal again. So verses that have, I guess, authority with regards to action. Okay. Okay. Well, I know the sister. She. She. I know she is. Uh, she, she. She's alluding to something. I can, I can see it. I can see it. So the muhkam is the ayat that are, they're, they're clear. Yeah, they're clear. Exactly. You see, they're clear. So last time we had a discussion about ukharu mutashabihat. Right? So the muhkam is something that is it's clear. It's clear, it's straightforward, it's easy going. So we've been talking for a number of days, so this is the fifth lecture, correct? We spoke of previously, which I think were extremely important lectures. If you have the extra time, if you haven't got a chance to listen to it, I think it's very important you listen to it. How, other than the concept of tafsir in these things and the levels of tafsir, we spoke of the ideology of siyaq, right? Which is contextualization. The science of al-munasaba and wal irtibat the connectedness of verses. It's such an important science. So it's an actually a science. Contextualization is actually a science. And we talked about how a person may recognize that, some examples of it. So, so very important. So in the context of what he's talking about here, the muhkam ayat are very profound in the sense that it is it's very clear. Right? It's very, it's very pure. Allah subhanahu تبارك الذي بيجي مبارك شيء الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوك ويجيب محسن على لا على It's very very clear. It's a muhkam, but you might still need to research. 
even though it's a muhkam, you still need to study it. Because again, it's our deficiency in the end. The ideology of having strength in the sciences. So we go, go on to what he's saying. You know, the very powerful statement 700 years ago, approximately 800 years ago. He is saying, Right? When we were talking about translation of the entire Quran, pro and or con, in this ideology. And he goes on to say, وَالْغَرِيبِ الْمَعْنَى بِمِقْدَارِ الضُّرُورَةِ إِلَيْهَا مِنَ التَّوْحِيدِ وَأَرْكَانَ الْعِبَادَاتِ So if it so happens in the context of this muhkam, there, there might be some statements that are slightly stranger. Go ahead and translate because of its connectedness to the meaning of these muhkam. In the sense where it is needed. Providing that, those, those uh, criteria. <laughs> what does that mean? Don't exceed. Don't exceed. Don't exceed. Don't exceed. means turn to, apprehend. Siwa dhalik. What is siwa dhalik? Other than that. Yeah, other than that. Because there are ayat in the Quran, as you know, it's, 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 we had a pyramid we talked about. There's the foundations, there's the middle, and there's the well advanced. So if a person attempts to, what he is, in his opinion, is Arkashi's opinion, you start attempting to translate the meaning of it, you have to have certain strength to be able to, at a high level, and to be able to relate to the person that is in reference to, giving the information to. So as you can see, he goes on to explain. So in, this vo- in his opinion, you shouldn't turn to that. You see, this, this next higher stage. وَلَا يُتَعَرَضْ لِمَا سِوَى ذَلِكَ وَيُؤْمَرُ مَنْ أَرَادَ الزِّيَادَةَ عَلَى ذَلِكَ بِتَعَلَّمُ الْلِسَانِ الْعَرَبِي In his opinion, if a person wants to get out of the ahkam and muhkam and start to research these higher, higher elements, in his point of view, that person needs to start studying Arabic. He needs to start getting advanced language capabilities in the Arabic language. And when we say Arabic, we're not talking about Arabic. What else are we talking about? Trivium. Trivium, yes, we talked about that. We're talking about ulum al-Qur'an, usul al-fiqh. These things that are so important. If a word person wants to, go to these other ayat. Yesterday, I'll get to you. Yesterday, I was giving a lecture, and after lecture, a person came to ask me questions. And he's talking to me, he starts to ask me ayat about the meaning and, and these type of things. And I realized that the person, you see, again, they didn't approach a surah al-fiqh, ulum al-Qur'an, in a standardized fashion of attempting to study the ayat. But the person, he's missing gaps. He's missing gaps in his understanding of things. Ulum al-irtibat, al-munasaba, these type of things. These are foundational things, but they're very important. as siyaq it's called the siyaq contextualization. And he's going to these ayahs and he's asking me the meaning of it. And I'm looking to him and I said, yani, in my mind I wanted to tell him in a way that he could understand that you need to take a step back. You need to go back to these usul, these foundations. Build yourself correctly. Then you can move on to these things and we can have this discussion for these type of things. And by the grace of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala, it was an interesting circumstance, but it's something just to think about. You can notice it sometimes. You'll be able to notice it at times. Because... Just the idea of contextualization is missing. And as we said previously, people nowadays, they say this, they, they contextualize in a different way. The way they do it is they contextualize based on the circumstances they're living in. They don't contextualize based on the circumstances and the criteria of irtibat and munasaba of the Qur'an, the surah, the end of the surah, and these things. So for example, for them, they see a circumstance, and then they'll say, Ah, with qala rabbuka bil malaik tisjuni adam. There's no contextualization. They saw an event that took place in their life or they're watching Hollywood or something happens. And then they, they say the ayah. There's no t- contextualization. Or they say, as we talked about pre- previously, the concept of um, And they place it without contextualization. So they give their meaning in the way that they like. Yeah, but what they're doing, actually, people don't know. They're actually doing tafsir. How is that possible? I don't know that ayah means. Yeah, okay, put that ayah aside. But the idea that if you see something, then you place an ayah, 
or you say an ayah based upon the circumstance you see, what are you alluding to? You're alluding to a connection between the circumstance and the ayah. So people, yeah, exactly. That's a good one. Yani you see the stars and say, Ayah, Rabbuk Ma'at Katigran. But the concept of other ayat, and depending on the circumstance, you place it immediately, is incorrect. So you see a circumstance, a person is difficult, he's sick. And then you say, for example, ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسب الأيد الناس. So you say his sickness is because he's a, he's a corrupt individual, for example. And this is, this is very sad. It's unfortunate, but it's, it, these are the things that people are doing. There's the lack of irtibat and munasabah. And we gave examples, the end of the surah, with the beginning of the surah, and the same with Qadr, Bakr ibn al-Arabi, he says the Qur'an is like one word, wahida. It's very important for people to think about this. So, فَأَمَّا تَرْجَمَتْهُ لِلْعَمَلِ تَرْجَمَتُهُ لِلْعَمَلِ بِهِ فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ جَائِزٌ لِلْضَرُورَةِ وَيَنْبَغِي أَنْ يُقْتَصَرَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ عَلَى بَيَانِ الْمُحْكَمِ مِنْهُ وَالْغَرِيبِ الْمَعْنَى بِمِقْدَارِ الضَّرُورَةِ إِلَيْهَا مِنَ التَّوْحِيدِ وَأَرْكَانَ الْعِبَادَاتِ وَلَا يُتَعَرَّضْ لِمَا سِوَى ذَلِكَ وَيُؤْمَرُ مَنْ أَرَادَ زِيَادَةَ عَلَى ذَلِكَ بِالتَّعَلَّمِ الْلِسَانِ الْعَرَبِي وَهَذَا هُوَ الَّذِي يَقْتَضِيهِ الدَّلِيلِ What does he say there? وَهَذَا الَّذِي هُوَ الَّذِي يَقْتَضِيهِ الدَّلِيلِ What does that mean? وَهَذَا هُوَ الَّذِي Yeah. So Imam Zarkashi is saying that this is what we're saying here, these criteria, these details, this is what references are proving. And his opinion, the adilla, is proving, the dadil, the proof, the references. وَلِذَلِكَ لَمْ يُكْتَبْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم إِلَىٰ قَيْسَرَ إِلَّا بِآيَةٍ وَاحِدًا And as a result, based upon these things, Prophet ﷺ, when he wrote to Qaysar, a letter, the only thing, he only wrote one verse on that letter. إِلَّا بِآيَةٍ وَاحِدًا مُحْكَمَةً لِمَعْنَى وَاحِدًا Do you see? It's one verse, it's a clear verse, and the essential meaning is one. Essential meaning is one. The statement of Azar Kashi, as I said, is before about 700, 800 years. Before he got to this statement, he was talking about opinions through history about translation, how to approach it, and these type of things. And then he reaches this point, and this is what he says. So important. That's so important. So if this means you should, uh, if you were to talk with people, the reason uh, considered talking about local ayat in public cities. So, look, look, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. Even the muhkam ayat for some people has become mutashabih. Okay? For some people for some individuals, because of reasons we've talked about previously. So it's very important when a person is speaking, that they are well aware of the people they are speaking, and well aware of their self. Mm-hmm. Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala, he argues, in using intellectual perspective, how a person can know God. He argues that you have to know yourself to be able to know God. So what does that mean? It means that if a person doesn't know the thing that's closest to them, how will they know something else? If you don't know who you are, and you're not honest with yourself, your deficiencies, your weaknesses, or where you came from, and where you're going, and among other things, how will you know in, in whole, wholeheartedly something else? If something that's the closest to you, you're living it, you don't know. You don't know yourself. So this is one of the catechisms that Ghazali Ta'ala, he provided for a person to stop and think about. So that in context of what present day elements, is the idea that you, we have to know that marginalized, or we don't say marginalized, minorities, wherever they are, it, it tends to, for these individuals, when to, to the general public, you tend to always be a representative of that minority. Okay? What does that mean? What, what does that mean when someone says that? People think with a broad brush with the minority. So if Yusuf says something, it's not Yusuf saying something. Every single Muslim and Syrian in the world stand out and say, Good. So, the, yeah. so one of the issues that people have when it comes to understanding minorities is they place every minority as a representative of that group. Anything and everything. 
So this, this is an issue minorities feel. This is the issue minorities they tend to feel. And they feel extra pressure. They see that they feel extra pressure. Realistically speaking, we know that we're past the era in which the Qur'an, you see, has been translated as a whole, and there are a number of translations out there. Unfortunately, the people that are translating are not necessarily up to par. And as you can see, they haven't studied a, n a number of things that are most important. And as you can see in the opinion of Zarqashi, they turned away from this philosophy that they had previously. There were people that it, they just knew a few verses and that was suffice for them for their lives. Just a few ayat for them, that was, that was sufficient for them. And the Prophet ﷺ, he, you know, in reference to such individuals, he said that would be sufficient for them. It's sufficient for them. But again, right now it's quantity versus quality. And again, right now it's, it's, it, it, it feels like people nowadays... It's very um, self-centralized. There's a lot of narcissism out there. So much care about yourself. Everything has to do with you and you and you. Everything has to do with you. And the greatness of you, and among other things as well. And as a side point, just to think about, the internet is a tool that could be very beneficial, but it could also be something that is very negative. In the context of what we're talking about, I think you can understand why. And the dangers that follow... I saw, I came across a video, there's an individual who is giving a lecture, and he wore a type of clothing, and on the camera it says, Imam so-and-so, and these type of things. So what's happening is someone that's very foundational, fundamental, is now has overhyped themselves to such a high level, to such a high level the ideology behind humbleness and these things, it's a very sad circumstance. The context where we're talking about, translations have happened, it's been done as a whole. Had we went back hundreds of years, maybe we could have had, uh, tried to explain a different point of view for people that don't know, that haven't spent the time. But that doesn't mean you can't learn, and we can't learn. It doesn't mean you cannot do the best you can. You see, and it doesn't mean that you cannot revivalize something. It doesn't mean that. So in connection to this regard, there are a lot of things we can benefit from. Humbleness, communication, among other things, but the concept of respect to the translation of the meaning, and the concept of how you do so, and the concept of taking the Qur'an as a whole as a translation. It's very important. فأما ترجمته للعمل به فإن ذلك جائز للضرورة ويبغى أن يقتصر من ذلك على بيان المحكم منه ولغريب المعنى بمقدار الضرورة إليها من التوحيد وأركان العبادات ولا يتعرض لما سوى ذلك ويؤمر من أراد زيادة على ذلك لتعلم اللسان العربي وهذا هو الذي يقتضيه الدليل لذلك لم يكتب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إلى قيصر إلا بآية واحدة محكمة بمعنى واحد because he knows قيصر doesn't speak Arabic, for example. Doesn't have the tools to comprehend essentially a number of things. One verse is provided, this verse is, was read, translated to the person he intended on sending that letter to. So what happens, Zarkashi goes on to explain. He goes on to more, more writing. And he says, because in the translation, so much is lost in it. And there could be tremendous deficiency in it. And also there could be issues that arise because the lack of comprehension among other things. Allahu Akbar. Are there any final questions, observations, feelings, opinions? So, if, if you, you have like, yeah, a number of things in this is, in the in the advice of a zarkashi, holding fast to those things, studying those things, that are of the foundational elements, taking into consideration of a different language among other things. As for the next step and third step, studying is fine, but 
attempting to study with somebody who might have other strengths that will be able to help you in comprehending that. That's actually very important. It's very, very important. Yeah. And you find that quite a bit. This question quite a bit. I know many people are so in high school. Yeah. yeah. So they study for the translation of their kids. Yeah, yeah. They just study for a test for the sake of translation. Yeah, I understand. And they are teachers and they study with them and they go there and they, and they just study for translation. What do you think about it? Well, like I said, uh, <coughs> portions of it, translating, explaining portions of it, but not leaving it as a whole for them to go ahead and, and read on their own. You see, for the, that perspective, they have the instructor with them as they study these muhkam ayat. And if they want to continue to a different ayat, making sure the instructors have the capability to be able to help them in that endeavor, which is something very important. And as I said, and previously I've said, religion is a very powerful thing. And when someone thinks that this is, this is what God wants from you, and they're very certain about that, it could be something good, but if the information they're understanding is incorrect, it could be something quite negative. God is the judge in the end. That is correct. But the ideology of us, we're dealing with the temporal world. We're dealing with the world that we're in. So it's something really to take into consideration. Uh, really, really take into consideration. Earlier, you brought up a very interesting philosophical point that I heard discussed before, but never really heard anything authoritative on it. Which you said, uh, God in the concept of time, the outside of time, is inside of time, that He creates time. What's the Islamic viewpoint of that? Well, my body exists outside of time. Yeah, yeah. So there's ayahs where it says, in my own mind, all the things that are all these things. And I don't, I don't know the proper answer. Yeah. Yeah, so on a foundational level, there's a prophetic tradition. So you're asking about time and <clears throat> in, the, in, in relevance to God in, among traditional Islamic theologians. Essentially, long story short, there is a prophetic tradition where it says, Yasub ibn Adam al Dahar, wa ana al Dahar. Yasub ibn Adam al Dahar, wa ana al Dahar, wa qalibu al layl ala al Nahar, wa qalibu al Nahar ala al layl. Wa kama qala Isa al Salaam. So a dahar in this element is in reference to a type of time. And the reference is alluding to the concept that indeed God essentially had, he incepted time. He al allowed time to exist. So God essentially is not affected by time. Not affected by time. So as a result, time is an element of God. And it exists, and things change, it moves around. So philosophers go into detail, time has a synonym, and its synonym, synonym is old age or a synonym is death, a synonym is this. So time is a philosophy, and they argue that it actually exists and has effects on people. When you look to a biblical perspective and a Quranic perspective, you find certain individuals that had, had lived extra time. When we say extra time, something that people are used to. So you find, for example, individuals that had long lengths of life. And the concept of, for example, Enoch in the Bible, he was taken up to heaven while still alive. The idea behind that in one perspective is that time doesn't affect him. God had removed time, its effect of time on him. The concept of Jesus in one opinion in which it says that God put him up to the heavens while alive, that's one opinion. Ibn Hazm has a different point of view. He believes he passed and God put him up, among other things, just for us to think about. In that opinion, they argue that time doesn't affect him doesn't affect Jesus. God we had removed the idea of time from affecting them. The concept of people having everlasting abode in these things, of a jannah to naim khalidin afiyah, the concept of time, its effect of time is being removed from those circumstances. So this is a more, more um, a biblical perspective, scriptural perspective, something to think about. Philosophy goes into great depth about what time entails, and it's one of the, most, one of the very important things for a person to think about. But in the light of time and God, essentially, traditionally, was God created time. It's a design of God. And the tradition reference particularly is that in Allah, because in the reference, people are angry because they get old and things change and they become weaker and these things, so they curse time. You see, they curse. What they mean by time, that change. And God is saying that this is something out of your hand. And this element is a design of mine. 
And this is something I have subjected upon the human being, that everyone is going to be affected by this, and you will grow older. And as you grow older, for example, Socrates and his friend had a discussion about what happens when you get older, and some of the thoughts start to creep in about having what, something more to life after you pass away. It starts to creep into the mind. So it, it bothers a person. It makes a person think slightly deeper. Even if they didn't believe in it, it's just like the thought that a possibility, these stories that were talked about, among other things as well. Allah. Yeah. One thing to remember as well, the ayah, which is a very powerful ayah that covers a lot of things, is هُوَ الْأَوَّلِ وَالْآخَرِ وَالظَّاهِرُ وَالْبَاطِنِ وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ So it's in the names and attributes of God, but it's important just to know foundationally in the traditional perspective is that names and attributes of God are different. As you know, لَيْسَكْ مِثْلِ شَيْءٍ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَوْكُفُ وَلَحَادٍ وَلَمْ مِثْلَ عَلَى فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ سُبْحَانَ وَبِكُ الْوَيْزَةِ مَا Names are actually attributes of God. Attributes of God. His names. But the thing we're talking about is the concept. The names and attributes have an overlap. There is some distinction as well. When you think of an attribute, you consider, for example, Yadullah. Yadullah fawqa aydihim. Or you consider, for example, Tajri bi a'yunina. A'yunina. The sense. I don't want to. Shirila. I don't want to point to my eyes so you think uh, anthropomorphistic pomorphic type of perspective. And or you think, for example, Tabarak al biyadihi al-mulk wa ala kulli shayin qadir. So those are the sifat, sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Asma' al-Rahman, you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for Ibn Hazm and Imam Malik, rahmanullah ta'ala, and others, if a person swears by any of the names and or attributes of God, it's a, it's a legitimate swearing. I don't mean swear to curse, I mean like you promise by God. An oath. So we're used to Wallah, but there's also Billah, or Tallah, uh, or Alladhi uh, biyadihi, Ruhi biyadi. You find the statements. Uh, you find the statement. You find it, Walladhi bi nafsi yadi, or kama qal Aisha salam. That the one in whom, you know, my soul is hands is in, etc. So in their perspective, these attributes, names and attributes, if a person swears by them, it's, it's legitimate. So the regime is swearing. Imam Shabbat has a different perspective. His school has a different perspective. But it's something to think about. In the context of what we're talking about, Ar-Rahman and Rahim and these things, some of them you can relate to. And it gives a type of understanding. But essentially his element is going to be different than essentially what we consider of these particular things. But it gives, it gives a sense. It gives a sense to it. So when it comes to names and attributes of God, traditionally it was always very important to remember Laysa Kmit Nihishay. Nothing like onto him, let me open local for one these type of things, yeah. Love. Take care everyone. Yeah.